Good morning, everybody. Hello. Well, it might be good evening or afternoon when you watch the video. Um, again, this week, we want to talk about communication. We're going to talk about communication styles. Uh, before we jump into that, um, I do want to give a scripture reference. Uh, Psalm 19 and 14, let the words of my mouth, mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And um, let's just do a quick word of prayer. Lord, as we get into this lesson today, Lord, just guide our words, open our hearts, and allow us to receive what it is you have for us, Father God. Father, allow us to decrease as you increase and share a word with these couples that may give them some guidance, may give them some understanding, may give them some knowledge, peace, and wisdom as they go forward and bettering their communication with their spouse. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So that was good. That was good prayer. <sighs> yes, it was a great prayer. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we jump into today's lessons on communication styles, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the communication challenge we faced since the last time we all got together. So I'll hand it over to Tosh. So um, the ladies may know this. I take a regular kind of like getaway, like. A, like, okay, I got to get away um, to kind of re-energize myself, refocus, um, and just whatever it is that I do. Most of the time I sit around doing nothing. It's not major. Um, and, you know, I had asked Freddie in the past before, like, you know, if you need to get a getaway, you know, you can do that. Don't feel like you can't go or do. And he's like, I don't, I don't need to go nowhere. He told me that. Um, you leaving is a break for all of us. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And at first I felt a certain kind of way about it, but then I was like, you're right. It is a break for all of us. Cause I, uh, don't have the compulsion to do everything and try to get everything done while everybody's home and, you know, cleaning and cooking and doing activities. So, um, so I take these trips regularly and, as a courtesy, I was just mentioning to Freddie that, hey, I'm thinking about going to Miami for my trip. Like, just letting you know, probably gonna get on the plane and go sit on the beach in the hot sun for a little while. And Freddie immediately invites himself to the trip. And when he invited himself to the trip, I was like, like, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I didn't ask you if you wanted to go to the trip. Well, I just said, I want to go to Miami, too. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I didn't ask him if he wanted to go to Miami uh, because I had no intentions of him going to Miami with me because it wasn't um, a trip for him. Because I thought to myself, if he wants to go to Miami with me, then he should have planned the trip. And it made me feel like, he only wants to go on the trip because so he can go to Miami. Not that he necessarily wants to be with me because I've been taking these trips for the last two years. So because I didn't express to Freddie um, when he invited himself to the trip um, that I didn't really want him to. It was not my intention, not that I didn't want him to, but it just wasn't my intention for him to go. And I kind of the more I thought about it, the more it bothered me. And then we had a um intense communication yeah we had a conversation like after we have already booked flights and made um arrangements for a place to stay then she shares that you know how it bothered her and you know i felt away because i was like maybe i should just cancel my flight now uh you know it would have been a lot more helpful tasha could have expressed to me how she really felt when I first invited myself. Um, I didn't think I had to ask, but if she, if she felt like I needed to ask, I, I wish she would have just said, babe, you know, I, I feel like you should have asked me if it was okay to come. And this is how I'm feeling about you coming. Um, when I get away, this is what I want to experience. And if you come, I might not have the opportunity to have the the, the experience I want to have, there'll be different expectations if you're there and I don't get to relax the way that I had envisioned relax. And so I think uh, the lesson learned there is, you know, being able to share with your spouse in the moment uh, how you feel about a situation as opposed to letting it kind of just, uh, for lack of a better term, fester 
and get to a point where you're feeling uh, negatively about something, uh, but you didn't really address it in the beginning. And, you know, we've gone down a path of, you know, on my end, I'm thinking everything is fine. I mean, we booked the flights or we making the hotel arrangements or what have you, and none of this has been expressed to, to me. So I don't have a clue that she's feeling a particular way and it comes out later. And uh, it was intense, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It was just, it was a whole lot. And I felt the way because it was after the fact. And I was like, you know, if this is how you really felt. Why didn't you just say this at the very beginning and we could have resolved all of that? You know, either we could have reached agreement that it made sense for the both of us to go. We could have had a better understanding or we could have said, all right, go ahead and go to Miami. I'll holler at you later. So, you know, it's one of those things where you live and you learn. I think the, the discussion later on was still a positive one in the sense that we gained better understanding of how each other felt uh, about the matter. Uh, the bottom line is we're going to Miami. Uh, we're looking forward to it, and uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, and also the part of the issue is that it's not that I didn't want Freddie to go to Miami with me. Um, it's just that, you know, we are still in the healing process of a lot of stuff that's happened in our relationship. And it was about me um, managing my expectations when he comes on a trip with me. And things that I want to happen, things that I don't want to happen, things that I think should happen. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always go that way. And for me, it just removes the aggravation and the frustration that I project because I don't know how it's gonna turn out um, on him going on a trip with me. And so don't get it twisted. We have a good time when we travel together and stuff, but there's just there was just a lot of other stuff that, that went along with that and um, just kind of made me feel a certain kind of way. And, you know, one of the things that we have learned to do is when you feel in a certain kind of way, you need to talk to your spouse about it. Be prayerful. Um, talk to your spouse about it. I actually talked to the the, the group, the ladies um, in the group. And, you know, one of the things that Jamala actually pointed out to me was the reason I was feeling a certain kind of way is because I felt like Freddie, I, I allowed Freddie to overstep a boundary that I had established for myself. And I was like you're right. And then a couple of the other ladies um, were pulling out the fruit of seeds that I had planted in them, <laughs> um, you know, when they're explaining what's happening and, you know, they're, they're taking the words that the Holy Spirit has given me to give them and they giving them right back to me. So I have to eat that fruit too, because those are the seeds that we are planting in like how we are interacting, how we're communicating, how we have to learn to receive um, the things that we're praying for, um, even if they don't come in the way that we desire them. So be open with your communication with your spouse. Um, but like Freddie said in the scripture, you know, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of um, my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, because there is a way that you can approach um, an issue with your spouse that doesn't have to be confrontational or it doesn't have to be negative. So we had an intense conversation and it was not negative. It was just a conversation to be had so that we could both express how we felt. And when we walked away from the conversation, we were still good. I mean, you know, we're sensitive, we're in our emotions, we feel a certain kind of way, but we were able to walk away from that conversation and it still be good. No doubt, no doubt. Um, I know that uh, it's been a couple of weeks. We, I just thought about it today. We owe y'all the outline from the last time we got together. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure I get that out to you all because I want you to have this uh, paperwork in hand uh, as reference material. I know some of you take notes when we chat. Uh, but certainly want to be able to uh, share that with you so you have it in writing. And I'll do the same for this after we do the call on Tuesday night. Uh, but now we're going to jump into uh, communication styles. It, it's a follow-on uh, to our intentional and active, communi active communication session, which included intentional uh, communication, uh, the, three, the three levels of active listening, uh, the habits of acting listening, active listening, 
and um, intentional communication and barriers to communication. So today we're going to be talking about communication styles. Just just to let you know, there are four styles, dominant, influencer, conscientious, and steady. So we'll be talking about those in a little more detail and we'll turn it over to Tasha. Okay. So the first communication style is a dominant. Um, people who have a dominant dominant personal style um, known in a similar fr framework as a director or a driver love action. They're action oriented. They're focused on results. They prefer to think about the big picture and leave implementation details to others. They are pretty, um, there's a pretty good chance that your boss is primarily a, a dominant communicator. Um, patience and sensitivity are within dominant communicators grasp, but require some effort on their part. And so, you know, what we'll talk about is how you, what you try to do as a dominant communicator and some of the things that you want to avoid doing. And then where do we fall into those categories, like where we think we fall into categories and then where you think your spouse may fall into that category as far as um, what we think we are as a style of communicator. So when you're communicating with someone that you recognize as a dominant style, uh, that Tasha just described, uh, try to get right down to business with them and stay on topic. Uh, be prepared to field follow-up questions on the spot so you can answer with confidence because they're going to want to know some details. So they're going to probably ask some questions. So be ready to answer those questions and then expect them uh, to be uh, decisive and fairly blunt. They like to get down to the brass tacks. Uh, that's really what a dominant communicator is about. So those are some things you should try to do when you're engaging with a dominant communicator. And some of the things that you might want to avoid doing with engaging a, with a dominant communicator is taking their bluntness or follow-up questions um, or their impatience personally, because it's not personal. They're just trying to get the information. Uh, making promises you can't deliver on because a dominant communicator is going to be want to be as clear as possible and then they're going to want to see those actions. So don't say you're going to do something and you're not going to do it because that's not going to work well with a, a dominant communicator. Expect them to be open um, about their weekend plans. <laughs> so, you know, if, so, if a dominant communicator is talking to you, just kind of like the situation that we were talking about, I feel like I'm a more dominant communicator, um, is that dominant communicators are gonna be open and they're gonna tell you exactly what it is. Um, uh, dominant communicators are often accomplishment, uh, accomplished, excitable, and they love a good challenge. Uh, they're the ones who want to recruit for the Moonshot Project, even, um, and I'm sorry, Moonshot Project, you've been um, noddling over. They, they use that word now, but what you've been dulling over. So a dominant communicator is going to be a very like get it done kind of person. And they're going to be excited about what they're doing. And they love the challenge of what's getting ready to happen. And they're going to be shooting, you know, so there's not going to be, it's not going to be ready, aim, 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 aim. It's going to be ready fire for a dominant communicator. I feel like I've fallen to um, a dominant communicator category um, as far as my communication style. You know, one thing I wanted to be clear uh, on expecting them, it says avoid expecting them to open up about their weekend plans. Oh, yes. So they're going to stay on task. They're task. not going to be all fluffy yeah. and having sidebar conversations and small talk. They want right. to get down to the point. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, so they're going to say, so a dominant communicator may answer a question about, oh yeah, which, oh yeah, I'm going to X, Y, Z, but they're not giving you all the details. They don't want you all in their business. Right. Unless they want you in their right, business. Right, right, So yes. Um, and, and then they're going to wonder, well, why are you asking me about my business? That ain't none of your business. <laughs> right. And sometimes I have that issue when, when Freddie starts to ask me questions, Ooh. right? Like, I will tell him something, but I don't want you asking me 50,000 follow-up well, questions. Well, remember, we talked about it at the retreat. She was like, and that's all I know. Yes, or because, that's all I'm going to say. Or, right, because yeah. that's, that's going to shut down a lot of the questions that I would have. And it keeps her from being frustrated with me asking a bunch of questions and it keeps me from being frustrated because I keep asking questions and she doesn't know the answer. Right. And even if they are my own plans, because sometimes I don't have sometimes a plan. Sometimes she don't know. I she just, just, I'm just going to do something and I don't know how that 
plan. You know, I haven't formulated a plan. It's just going to happen. So that's a dominant communicator slot style. We're going to go to influencer. Influencers are people with the uh, influence of personal style known as in similar frameworks as an initiator, a socializer are your classic people, people. They are friendly, upbeat, and always on the pulse of the latest trends. They thrive on interpersonal relationships, which make them ace collaborators. A word of caution though, long-term focus and follow through aren't their strong suits. So best to engage them in shorter collaborative bursts. A few things to keep in mind when communicating with influencers is and Tasha, which but before she does that, uh, I would say I'm more of an influencer type than a dominant type. Who, uh, me? me. I'm oh, more yeah. of an influencer type than a dominant type. I am about those interpersonal relationships. I I, I leverage those to engage. Uh, I think when Tasha and I went through this initially, uh, we see ourselves as a, as a combination. And uh, maybe you all will guess what you think those are as we go through. So we've gone through dominant influencer, though. Uh, is a little uh, less uh, uh, engaged on the long-term focus and the follow-through. And um, influencers try to what, Tosh? If they, you're engaging with one, yeah. what do you need to do? Um, you, you need to try to be um, approached in a more casual manner and let your sense of humor show. So they, they it's the touchy-feely thing for the influencers when they're communicating. Put details and facts in writing for them to refer back to in verbal conversation. Details and facts, right? Because Freddie loves the details. I mean, I love details too, and I see myself a little bit as an influencer, um, the way I engage people, because I definitely use my... Um, my gift of influence, uh, but sometimes all I want you to do is just get it done. I, you can, he can get caught up on the details. I don't want to do that. So, but when you're communicating with an influencer, that's why he asked so many questions because he likes the details and in, in, in the facts. Expect them to be a little too optimistic about ideas as well as their own abilities and the abilities of those around them to actually do stuff. So, an optimistic. Um, you know, influencer is going to be like, yeah, we can do it. You, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you, you're always optimistic, like in a sense, but I think that you are definitely uh, like an influencer when it comes to communication style. So what are some of the things that you should try to avoid when dealing with? See, before we go, you know, <laughs> see how you just want to call things out. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I think I'm optimistic. Maybe not all the time, but uh, maybe I'm less than what it says here. I don't think I'm too optimistic about things. I think that over I time... I think I'm positive. You, I think over time you become more optimistic. Because uh, okay. you used to be a little bit pessimistic. Okay. And I was more of like... No, not pessimistic. More realistic. You were more of a real realist Realist. type okay. of person. Yeah. So when you're communicating with an influencer, here's some things you need to try to avoid. Talking down to them or being curt. Trying to confine the conversation or stifle their freedom to express ideas and emotions. They want to share their emotions. They want to share their ideas. You got to let them open up a little bit, even if you're not down with opening up. Um, you have to avoid expecting them to dive deep into details with you. Uh, so again, um, they're not going to really go into the details. They're going to stay at a high level in that sense. Uh, influencers strive to be emotionally honest and are quick to trust those around them. Uh, if you're trying to reshape the culture of your team, an influencer might be the perfect partner in crime. Mm -hmm. um, it might be your spouse or it might be somebody you work with, but there are definitely some people around you uh, that are influencers and I'm sure many of you can relate to those individuals. Mm -hmm. So pass it back to Tosh. All right. So the third um, type of communicator is a steady communicator. People who have a steady personal style um, known in a similar framework is a, a relator or a harmonizer, emphasizing cooperation and are both, uh, and low, I'm sorry, and low to upset the apple cart. Uh, they value consistency, stability, and loyalty, and you'll often find them in a service flavored role um, in customer support, IT desk, uh, they can adapt quickly when they have to, but may need some extra en encouragement along the way. And so this person is really, uh, they want to keep the peace. 
right? There's gonna, there's gonna, be, they're always gonna be the person of reason, or they're always gonna be kind of like reflective and say, oh yeah, I can see it that way. They may not necessarily agree with it, but they're gonna <laughs> be like, oh, I can see your point, and um, you know, so they're gonna remain steady. They're gonna remain. Um, New, they're gonna, this is probably the person that's going to remain most neutral and you're not going to get them to commit on much of anything because they're going to be trying to be like, I'm not trying to walk, rock the boat. Yeah. I can see what you're saying and I can see what they're saying. And they may try to bring the two conversations together, um, but they're not, they not going to rock the boat. So a few things to keep in mind when communicating with steadies. Uh, try to practice active listening and confirm that you've heard them by summarizing what they've just said to you. Uh, you want to you wanna definitely be on the same page with them and make sure you're clear from them. Um, try to avoid them. I mean, I'm sorry, approach them with a relaxed vibe and break the ice by acknowledging a recent contribution they've made. So you want to kind of acknowledge something they've done. Uh, I guess that gets them in a, in a good frame of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and also try to um, expect them to ask for details. So they're going to ask for some details. They're going to want to understand things. Um, and um, they're those even keel. That's the even keel folks. You you know those people uh, that are serious harmonizers, relators, and uh, always trying to uh, emphasize cooperation. So mm -hmm. um, things to avoid. With Is them. rushing them into a decision. Don't don't rush them into a decision. Um, assuming they support an ideal 100% just because they don't voice opposition, right? Because remember, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, I see this point, I see this point. Uh, and just because they see your point doesn't not necessarily mean they agree with you, right? So don't um, don't assume, you know, because, you know, a lot of times we assume stuff and then we're totally wrong. Um, and that's when we, we talked on the retreat about like making an assumption about what people feel or what people think uh, based on what they say. So like if you, if I said I'm going to the store, um, you may assume that I'm gonna be right back, but I could be going to 15 different stores. So don't make assumptions, don't project onto uh, what they are saying uh, when they're talking. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't know. I, what? Where I was, yeah, no. I, I know that you know I'm the third bullet. Yeah, I was like, it's the it? fourth word. Yeah, I'm like, what is that? Yeah. Um, just expect them to have priorities and deadlines, and it helps them to to spell out. Um, well, I, I guess this word we're not as familiar with it. Yeah. I okay, into it, I n t u i t. We yeah, have I to look know. that up. But <laughs> don't expect them to. I guess it's saying to. Uh, understand or comprehend what the priorities and the deadlines are. Right. You got to spell that out. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, cause, cause they'll be all over the place <laughs> and you're going to be like, um, that is not what we're supposed to be doing right now. Yeah. Cause they're going to be, they're the harmonizers. They're like, kumbaya, my Lord, you know, kumbaya. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and avoid also studies are even kill people who love to be cooperative in an environment where everyone understands their roles and responsibilities. If your team is in turmoil, a steady likely won't lead the effort to restore normalcy, but they'll um, but they'll be a strong ally. So they're not going to take the initiative. Like they can see that the ship is sinking, but they're not going to say mayday, mayday, mayday. <laughs> I like the dominant communicator. Yeah, Just I like the dominant. Take charge. Mm -hmm. So the last communicator is conscientious. So we had dominant, influencer, steady, and the fourth is conscientious. People of the conscientious personal style, known in similar frameworks as an analyzer or thinker, prioritize precision and place a high value on competency. They jump at the chance to demonstrate their expertise and build new skills. Just the sort of person you're likely to find in the engineering, data science, or analyst role. They aren't unfriendly, per se, but probably won't chat you up about weekend plans or volunteer to organize a team dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, a few things to keep in mind. Well, let me just say this before we go to things to keep in mind before we communicate with a conscientious type. Yeah, these are the types that are, they're, they're in that spreadsheet. They're in the weeds on what they're doing and they, they want to focus on the data. They want to, you know, really pull out um, some of the details. You know, they 
like they said, they're gonna want to show off their expertise. They're always looking to hone their skills. And uh, I'm sure you know some of these types. I, I work at an engineering firm. I work around a lot of people like this. They don't want to deal with the client. They just want to do the project. They want to do the work. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with all the other mm -hmm. stuff. So I, that's what I think about when I think about a conscientious person. And some of the things that engage or try to do when you're engaging with them is what? Is to provide as many details um, as possible up front. Um, give them as much information as possible. Um, be organized and systematic as you can. Like, it needs to make sense to them. Like, when you're giving them the details, it, it needs to be making sense and it needs to be in order. Give them clear expectations and space to work independently. They don't need you micromanaging them, right? They just tell them what to do, tell them what, what you need to have done, and then just let them do it. They are really good. They're really good at what they do. So just let them operate in their space. And expect them to double tr and triple check all the relevant information before making a decision. So you can't rush this person. In, like when, when you're talking, you can't rush them into making a decision. Well, you or, yeah. And, and, you know, it's like we have people like that. Like um, you'll come to a meeting and, you know, they're fact checking everything that you're saying. Right. Or they're writing down everything that you're saying so that they make sure that they have all the details. And when something goes awry, they're going to say, well, you said on October 31st, 2020, that X, Y, and Z was going to be the case. But that's not what happened. So I made my decision based on what you said. So you have to um, be mindful if your spouse is like that, when they bring everything to the table, and then they just need you to be patient while they make a decision on what's going to happen next. Absolutely. And here are some things you should avoid when you're communicating um, with a uh, conscientious communicator. Um, avoid framing feedback on their work as criticism. <laughs> they might not take that too well. Yeah. Um, also avoid responding to them emotionally. Use words like know or think instead of feel. Um, remember, these are the fact people. These are the data people. These are the people that don't really get into the emotions. Uh, and, and think about your spouse in, these, in the context of all we we're talking about. Avoid expecting them to ease into a conversation with chit chat. Nah, they ain't got time for that small talk. They want to get down to the specifics. And conscientious types are not only cautious, but highly systematic. Uh, they're the person you want to partner with when assessing risks or running a pre-mortem of the project you're about to launch. So again, these are individuals uh, that are going to really be uh, in the weeds on the facts and really uh, looking at all the details. So uh, very similar to another type that we talked about. Uh, but a little difference in that mindset. Like they really want to take charge. They really want to be left alone. They really want to get it done. And then they'll highlight you when they have it complete. So those are the four areas. I, and I'm going to turn it back over to Tasha. You might want to show them a little diagram yeah, that so, we'll pass it on. Yeah, and we'll talk. So you guys, you're going to get this diagram where it talks about um, the four types of communicator. And we'll just kind of bullet point um, the ones that we discussed, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but you will see the dominant, the influencer, the steady, and the conscientious um, communicator. And, um, you know, what you'll see is that some of the characteristics of these communicators are so dominant. Like I said before, you're decisive, you're efficient, you're intense, you're results oriented, you're competitive, and you're risk tolerant. And not only on here do you see the four you know, types of communicator, you will see that they, there's a grid in which, um, you know, they're, they're falling in. So you have excitable and then you have people oriented, you have task oriented, and then you have even kill. Um, and so some of the, um, influencers characteristics are what, Freddie? Outgoing, enthusiastic, persuasive, relationship oriented, uh, lively and optimistic. Uh, so I, I definitely feel like I fall more on that side than the dominant side. So if you're talking about Freddie and Tasha, I feel like you know, she's more of a dominant communicator. I'm more of an influencer uh, type. So it's good for us to understand that as we grow our communication and our relationship, just gaining a better sense of 
you know, and, and some of these things you already know about your spouse. Spouse, mm -hmm. this is just really putting it into more formal uh, terminology. Yeah, pragmatic kind yeah. of thing, yeah. yeah. And then you have a steady communicator, which is uh, cooperative, relaxed, patient, support, uh, support oriented, friendly, and thorough. And so um, a steady, steady communicator is gonna be more on the people oriented side and the even kill. Um, the influencer is going to be more over on the excitable and people oriented. Uh, the dominant communicator is going to be on the excitable and task oriented side. And then you have conscientious, which is. So conscientious is a systematic, logical, reserved, process oriented, cautious and risk averse. So they're really thoughtful about everything, really wanting to make sure that they take calculated steps. And on this chart, they fall on the task-oriented and even kill uh, side of the house. So um, I know that I'm, I feel like when I'm looking at this diagram, I'm more on the right side, more of an influencer and more of a steady. Uh, so it's like even kill, people-oriented and excitable. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you necessarily, do you think you fall totally on the, on the left. left side? I fall, I fall on, I think I fall like um, mostly in like, three categories uh more of a dominant influencer but i am uh conscious because freddie says i'm risk adverse um and so uh some stuff i am very logical and pragmatic about and there is a process but my process is not something that has to be like we doing this no this is the process there's going to be some flexibility in it but i i totally think that i'm a dominant communicator because i'm all about um the big picture and then I just kind of know that it's going to fall into place and the people that I have around me are going to be um, good team teammates to me. Let's see. Decisive, efficient, intense, results-oriented, competitive, risk tolerant. Okay. Yeah, I think she's pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also outgoing, enthusiastic, persuasive, relationship-oriented. I, I think lively. you're an influencer type. I, yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I don't disagree. And I that. think... I think too, it's also when you are communicating, you have to know what type of communicator to be to the type of person that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so that's a part of being a good communicator because I can't be this dominant person to a three-year-old. I have to be an influence. I have to be outgoing and energetic. So you have to know, you know who you're talking to and when you're talking to. And I think we talked about that a little bit um, at the retreat is that you know, sometimes we don't put those filters on when we're talking to our spouse. We sometimes may just talk to our spouse crazy and not be thinking about the impact of our words and the things that we do as it relates to our spouse. And we don't, um, we're not as kind and we're not as gentle to our spouses as we might be to a stranger or a coworker. So I think that as we look at the type of communicator we are, um, even in our intentional communication, our active listening, you know, our communication, like getting to the four steps and how we work through that process, you know, think of think about who you are and think about who your spouse is. Is is your dominant communication style effective with your conscientious or steady um, communicator? right? Because you're not both going to be a dominant communicator, right? You're both not going to be an influencer. You're both not going to be steady. You're both not going to be conscientious, but you need to think about what you are as a communicator and then what your spouse is as a communicator and how they are going to receive um, your communication style. Because there's all things that we try to try to do and things that we try to avoid when dealing with different people of communication style. Absolutely. No, I, no, I totally agree. I, I think we have to be mindful of um, what type of communicator our spouse is and then adjust accordingly uh, to engage with them sometimes, knowing that they're going to maybe want details or knowing that a spouse is going to ask a lot of questions or knowing that your spouse doesn't get into the weeds and is not going to have a lot of details being mindful at going in and all right well does it make sense to ask all these questions because i already know uh it's only going to go but so far and and then taking the onus on your own to do the research you need to do sometimes 
um, because it's like, why well, ask the question? Just go look it up yourself. Because right. it, it saves everybody um, some pain. Yeah, um, yeah, and you can't yeah. be so. And I and I'm glad that you said that because um, sometimes we take the attitude as. He could take the attitude, well, you know I'm going to ask the question, so why you just don't have all the answers, right? Because sometimes we take that as the attitude that we should have when dealing with our spouses. Well, you know I do this, or you know I like that, so why you just didn't do it like that? Because that's not them, right? You can't put your stuff on your spouse just because you like to do it a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And it's like, he... Freddie will continue to ask me questions. And then I had to wise up too, because there was just certain things about me that I just, I wasn't interested. Like, I'm not interested. Like if my sister called me and said, we going such and such, I'd be like, okay, you know, and, and I'm cool with that. I know the date and the time I'm supposed to be there and I'm just going to show up. And so then I pass the information along to Freddie and then Freddie started asking me details like well what time we need to leave and what do we need to bring and you know blah blah and I'm like I so you know what know. I just call her sister I'm like that right, right I'm gonna ask all the questions I want to know <laughs> call her sister and then I can run down my list yeah and then I'm good yeah yeah but it doesn't need to be a bone of contention between the two of us nah I just call her sister he just you know he knows he can't get the and it's not that I'm not willing to give him the information I'm willing to give him the information that I have but I can't give you something that I don't have right and I already know she didn't ask these questions, so I'll just call yeah, her and I, I ask don't, yeah. the questions myself. And then we all good. Yeah, we're all good. Yeah, we're yeah. all good. I have all the information I need. I got it directly from the source. Right. Tasha is good because she just know the time and the date. And I'm good because I got all the details that go with that. Yeah, and that's kind of like happened with what happened with our Miami trip is that because he knows that, you know, I'm just saying I'm going to go to Miami. He knows I'm going to go to Miami. But... I don't, I don't have no details. I don't know where I'm staying. You know, I don't know, you know, what I'm going to do. You know, I'm just, just going. But he's detailed. So when he decided he was going on my trip, he started planning the trip. He started like, okay, well, I'm going to call this person so we can get hooked up with this. I'm going to do this so we can do this. And that's not how I how I operate and how I roll unless it's my intention to do that. See, she just gave me revelation. That's why I... I'm stressing my daughter to give me colleges so I can start making phone calls and working on details. And um, I guess she more, um, I don't know, she, I can't say she's like Tasha, but it's like she just doesn't understand everything that goes with that. It's more than giving me a name. I don't want to know the names of the colleges for the sake of knowing the names of the colleges. I want to know which universities we're considering so I can figure out who I know that's connected to these universities yeah. so I can start utilizing right. my relationships as an influencer yeah. to start influencing the environment where yeah. she could potentially be. Yeah, and you have um, to understand that as a communicator what your motivation is. The motivation of Freddie asking me those questions are not to annoy me, what which it often does, but his motivation to ask me those questions is to get as much detail as possible so that he can just make sure stuff is right. Like, if we're going to go, he wants to be prepared. He wants to you know, know his surroundings. He wants to know the ins and outs, what to expect, um, what to bring, you know, like, so what do we need to, um, you know, make that happen, you know? So it's a lot that understanding the motivation of your communicator also helps you to, yeah, that's good. That's good. you know, right. Understanding the motivation of your communicator. Like I plan, the logistical aspects of the retreat, meaning the facility the, in, in dealing with the initial engagement with the caterer. Then I let her take over because that's her forte. But those types of things like the dates, where we're going to stay, like there's certain things I got to know. And it's better for me to coordinate that as opposed to trying to ask Tasha a bunch of questions that she hasn't asked someone. Mm -hmm. And then I got to go and do the follow up. So right. we stay in our respective lanes as we plan things, we yeah. know Tasha is the better with the finances. I, I know that I go to work. That's about all I know. I know that I get paid. Sometimes I lose track. Tasha handles all of that. Mm -hmm. I trust her with that. I, I, that's just not my area. Yeah. You know, I just, that's not me. And, and I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's important to also recognize I'm a planner by profession. 
So um, I just know in my mind, if I have it in my mind, how it's going to work, I'm not worried about anything else because it's just, I know it's going to work. I know me, but Freddie likes to have the details like that pragmatic, conscientious, let's See, lay I'm, it out. I'm thinking about y'all because I got to... <laughs> Yeah, people, there are other people that need to know this information. Yeah. You can't just be in your head. In my head, I would, but you know, <laughs> and you're right. But some people who trust me be like, okay, she got it covered, yeah. and so I'm, I'm not going to worry about worry about it. But there are people who need the details because you got to get off work and you know, blah blah. All I'm saying is, okay, we're gonna go to Outer Banks on this weekend, and then everybody be like, bet. <laughs> so it's like, but it is important, and those things are like. He, I yield to Freddie because I know that's his strong suit. Have I done it? Have I, yeah. Ha, do I get paid to do it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But when it comes for other people, for other people, but when it comes to the two of us or, you know, our family vacations or even, you know, our um, vacations that we take together, it is something that he takes the lead on. And I allow him to do that because it, it it's just better for both of us because I don't have to worry about all the 50,000 questions and he can rest in the shore to know that I then got all the he has all the details, like the folder. Yep. And then I'll take care of, like when we get to the retreat, he's like, okay, you know, what we talk about, what, you know, and I have like, my mental has been on, okay, this is what this looks like. This is what this looks like. This is how we're doing this. This is what we're yep. saying here. This is the, you know, so then we're able to take all of the stuff and we're able to make a successful um, yep. endeavor because we work to our strengths. Yep. Yep. I, I think about the space where we're going to have this session. Um, is it enough bedrooms? Where is the cook going to be? Do they have enough stuff for their, the cook? I got to show him the pictures, you know, that she's, meanwhile, she's been thinking about what we going to say to y'all and how we going to say it to y'all. Mm -hmm. And I've, I have a little bit of that, but then she kind of takes the lead on that. And then we bring it all together and voila. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and so he, you know, and, and even when I'm dealing with other people, like Brandon can, t can attest to this. I'd be like, all right, Brandon, you need to show up on this day. This is what we're doing. And then he started asking me 50,000 questions. And I look at him and I was like, yeah. I don't care. Just make sure the music work. Make sure we can hear the pe people, you know. I don't care. You get paid to do stuff, just do it. And so I, you know, and it, you know, Freddie, I think you're a little bit of the conscientious where you need to have like the details and the, you know, so you can make an informed that, decision. Definitely a little conscientious in me. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't do the workout that I Absolutely. Do. Um, Absolutely. I'll say this, though. I do feel like we're kind of starting to. Yes, go down a path yes. of rambling. Yes. <laughs> I, they're, they're, I don't know if we're going to be able to no, get to it not. today. It's 42 minutes in. We probably try to keep these at 45 minutes. Absolutely. We want to talk about the Ten Commandments of Communication. That was actually planned uh, to be a session on Saturday, but Adam and Eve got so lively. Uh, between Adam and Eve and the exercise on Saturday, we couldn't get to it. And we were going to just basically um, do the first commandment and talk about um, experiences with that first commandment of communication. Uh, we were going to kind of talk through it and give you guys an example of how we were going to talk through it. And then we were going to go to the second uh, commandment of communication and give it to a couple and allow them to talk about their experiences uh, with that particular commandment and how they've either been challenged in that area or how they've succeeded in that area. We were going to make it very interactive mm -hmm. and go around the room because there were enough of us to cover all 10 uh, and then come back to us, I think, um, uh, with the last one, because there were nine couples. So we would have done, yeah, the first one and then and the last one. And the last one. Yeah. So and, we uh, will we will do that, um, but we won't do that in this session. Um, so as we prepare, um, we're going to be talking on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, we will um, kick it off with the first commandment. Um we will assign you all your commandments. So you'll have a little bit of a homework assignment. And then when we come back the following alternate Tuesday, we will have a recording from you, for you, but we want to lead with what you all discuss as far as how you handle um, the commandment that you were assigned in communication. All right. Y'all have a great day. And uh, hopefully you will look at this um, before the... Uh meeting on Tuesday night. Let's do something here at the end and see if they got to the end of the video.
uploaded. Well, we approved. If you got to the end of the video, <laughs> you know that we are stumped for an idea right now. And we're looking at you very ridiculously. And, uh, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, if so, how will we know if they watch the video all the way through the end? If we do something now, oh, we'll okay. know if they watch the video to the end. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got. You. Okay, so you know how, ladies, y'all got the assignment about, um, you know, being intentional with your husband, and um, we gonna do something at this video, and you gotta tell us at the beginning of the call of the call what we did at the the video. What do we do? <laughs> he came up with it, so he just had to go with what I. She said, "Lick my tongue." <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Y'all have a good one. We'll see y'all on Tuesday. <laughs>